is um, yeah one of the uh, yeah most clever guys I, ha I have met. He's a uh, uh, he's a consultant in, in cardiac thoracic imaging at Brompton Hospital. He, he completed his training in London uh, and and um, and did his research on looking at two years on, on the MRI scan at, at, at Brompton Hospital. Um, Tom's uh, research interest is uh, primary lung imaging and use of cardiac CT techniques in pediatric practice, including neonatal coronary CT. So, uh, Tom Sample. And maybe, Atal, if you can just give me a nod if you can hear me. Yep, yep, we can Perfect. hear you. Cool, thank you. I was just frantically in the background trying to work out whether to uh, swap the order. <laughs> um, so, firstly, hello. Um, and thank you for, for joining us. It's an extremely surreal experience uh, presenting online, uh, not least because I don't know if the others have uh, found the same thing. What do you wear to give a virtual talk? Do you, uh, do you put your, your suit on above and your pyjama trousers below? Do you go the whole way? I don't, I don't know. So it's a, yes, an odd, uh, odd times. Um, so um, well, I'll get to the point. <laughs> um, I normally try and fit way too much into talks. So I've kept this quite focused. Um, you've got Kathy up next, who's going to talk more about, uh, about CT. And um, so I thought what I'd do with the, the time that I've got uh, is take you through some possibilities of what we can use MRI for already. Uh, what I've spent the last couple of years working on uh, in terms of what we can do next, uh, at which point I've got to thank Dom for, for setting it up, because uh, this is basically uh, going to become the, the visual equivalent uh, of an LCI. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, so, move that out of the way. Um, so previously MRI hasn't really had much of a role to play in respiratory imaging. The, the you know, lung is mostly air, you don't get any signal back from air, um, so it's been a bit of a, a black hole uh, when it comes to uh, imaging by MRI. Things have changed, uh, we have new scanners, they're much much more sensitive, they're much faster at gaining their signal and they gain more of it. Uh, we have new sequences that are less um, susceptible to motion artifact, and we have new ways of gating our scans so that the lungs are, are more still from image to image. Therefore, we're getting more useful information. Uh, so it's really starting to come into its own. Uh, and then the last bit, I'm going to start talking about how we use MRI to actually demonstrate uh, ventilation uh, and where we can go from here. Um, so firstly, why MRI? We, uh, we already use it. This, this picture is not new. This is from five or six years ago uh, when I was at Great Ormond Street. Um, it's already very much used for cancer staging. Uh, this is a child with an extensive posterior mediastinal uh, neuroblastoma. Um, MR really comes into its own when it's not necessarily looking at the lung parenchyma itself, but it's looking at the chest wall, looking at soft tissues, particularly the, if you can see the point of the interface between two different soft tissues, so in this case, uh, tumour and the chest wall. So you're looking for invasion into bone, into muscles and so on. It's much, much better at C uh, than CT. Uh, when it comes to that differentiation of abnormal and normal soft tissue. Uh, this is another example of something fairly similar in, a, in an older uh, adolescent with a large uh, sarcoma. It has the same advantage of CT in that you can give uh, contrast agents that demonstrate uh, bits of viable tissue versus bits of necrosis in the center. And again, with that extra uh, ability to, to show soft tissues next to each other. There are a number of different tricks that we can play by MRI, which are much better by MR than by CT. And so this is a video of that same patient during free breathing. You can see the front of the chest wall moving in and out. You see the lungs moving up and down, the diaphragm at the bottom and the liver underneath that. And with it, this large tumor, I say fairly irrelevant here, it's obvious, but uh, with a smaller tumor, this technique is very useful to show if the diaphragm is involved. In this case, this tumor is going through the diaphragm and into the abdomen, it's moving alongside the air. Uh, uh, the, the diaphragm, not independently. Uh, we're using it clinically at the Brompton as a follow-up tool. Uh, so one major advantage of uh, MR over CT is the lack of radiation. As a result of that, you can follow things up uh, at a far higher frequency uh, than you would by CT. Uh, this is a young adult with cystic fibrosis who has a large mycetoma uh, in the left upper lobe. She's also unlucky enough to have CF-related liver disease. Uh, and as you guys, I'm sure, are well aware, a lot of the, the uh, treatments are extremely hepatotoxic. And um, so in a particularly fragile patient, what would be really nice would be to show that your treatment is or isn't working. Uh, there's no point in leaving somebody on a uh, hepatotoxic drug for a long period of time without that follow-up if it's not having any clinical benefit. Uh, 
um, and the way that we do this, uh, just to cover ourselves with regards to the slight differences in what you can uh, visualize by CT and by MRI is at time point zero, uh, so this was in January for this lady, um, image via CT and MRI on the same day. And this MRI doesn't need to take long. Uh, we can do structural imaging of the lungs in just over a minute. So we can have a five to 10 minute uh, appointment time and get plenty of, uh, of imaging from it. Uh, we then repeat just the MRI on its own at regular intervals. So this is six weeks later, showing that that mycetoma is very much the same in its size, its configuration, as is the thickening of the bronchus that we saw on CT in the right upper lobe. So we can use it as a frequent follow-up tool at an interval which would be uncomfortable using CT up. Uh, similarly, this is a, a child with um, tracheobronchial uh, papillomatosis uh, with large cavitating lesions in the lung. So another advantage of MRI again, it's better at its soft tissue differentiation. Here are those same cavities and we can differentiate soft tissue nodules like this from adjacent fluid levels. They have very different signal characteristics. We can then use this as a structural follow-up te uh, technique, saying so, that, uh, again, as you're well aware, the risk with these papillomas is that one of them, or more than one of them, become malignant over time. It would be nice to have a follow-up test which shows us a change in uh, configuration without repeating CTs uh, frequently, and b to add some functional information or quantitative information. So here's that same girl's PET CT with areas of vividity in that uh, in the soft tissue nodules that I showed you on the previous uh, image. This is a diffusion weighted image uh, using some respiratory gating techniques which again show these slightly darker areas of signal. These are areas where the diffusion is restricted, the water's less able to move through areas of densely packed tissues, for example. If we draw a region of interest around these, we can follow up the tissue characteristics over, uh, over time, creating a, a new way of following up uh, lesions without having to repeat a PET-CT on a yearly or twice yearly basis. Um, let's move away from larger lesions towards things that are slightly smaller, uh, maybe harder to show. This is a 14-year-old uh, a with what on biopsy uh, is likely to be an uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Easy to see the big, extremely thick-walled uh, dilated esophagus. What might be harder to see potentially is the airway. Well, actually, if you take a, a decent enough exposure, it's not really an exposure, decent enough uh, acquisition uh, with uh, little motion, you can very nicely see the airway here. If I zoom in on that, you can actually even make out the C-shaped cartilage ring supporting the trachea there, showing that this trachea has been displaced forwards and to the left. Now, what would be really lovely here would be to show you not just the fact that it's been displaced, but what's happening to it from a dynamic point of view. And as I showed you with that diaphragm with the lesion moving up and down, uh, MR is a brilliant cine technique. So here we go. This is uh, not the same patient, clearly. Uh, this is an adult part of a trial which we started just before COVID-19 took over, so I'm hoping to get back to it at some point in the not so distant future. Uh, this is one of our respiratory physicians taking large breaths in and then forcefully exhaling. And what you can see nicely in the centre here is the trachea with the posterior tracheal membrane bowing in. So part of the point of this trial is to show how much uh, tracheal collapse is normal in asymptomatic individuals and to compare that to symptomatic individuals. Uh, there are other things that we can do by MR that are not quite so good by CT. Uh, so this is a, a four-month-old who some of you may know with bad pulmonary hypertension, uh, background lung disease, very wet-looking lungs. Uh, on MRI a couple of weeks later, uh, when the left lung had cleared and the right had stayed fairly abnormal, uh, we can play another little trick uh, of MRI. So this lung, to start with, is not normal. It's full of this kind of mesh-like uh, reticulation, which is known as the... Um, Oh, come on, nutmeg sign, that's it. It's tempting to call it like a honeycomb sign. It's the same kind of mesh-like appearance, but honeycombing has been taken elsewhere. Uh, so everything's got to have its name. This is the nutmeg appearance. Uh, this is uh, the, the appearance of lymphatic congestion in this, in this case. And the, uh, the MRI trick that I wanted to show you here is this. So if you inject contrast under CT, we generally speaking do a single or at most two acquisitions after it. So you end up with one time point, and a second time point after that. One of the advantages of being able to image frequently, as you can in MR, is you can repeat of the image and form uh, basically an, um, a movie, if you like, of the direction and timing of contrast moving through the body. This contrast has been injected into a node in the groin. It's following up the retroperitoneum into the chest along the hyla and then spilling out 
into the right lung. So this is called pulmonary lymphatic perfusion syndrome. Uh, the lymphatic fluid shouldn't ever move down the hilum and into the lung. It should move up the thoracic duct into the, uh, the vein at the top. This is a retrograde perfusion of this lung, which is causing this lymphatic congestion uh, and an accompanied chylus uh, effusion. So CINE imaging, dynamic imaging, dynamic contrast acquisition, very much strengths in MR. We're good at showing big structures. Uh, and as I said, uh, that contrast is there. So what I wanted to ask for my uh, MD is, could you replace CT by MRI? Now I'm a complete uh, CT geek. I love it, it's a fantastic test. And this is definitely not going to be replaced by MR in some situations. But if you pick your target carefully, there are some groups of patients where actually having a repeatable non-ionizing uh, radiation technique would be fantastically useful. Uh, and our carefully picked population uh, is those with cystic fibrosis. Um, so here is a 19 year old with cystic fibrosis uh, enrolled as part of our trial. The image over here is the CT. And then we've got our MRI uh, over here at the same time point. These are on the same day as each other, about two hours apart. You can quite nicely see some tree and bud nodularity, so ace and a plugging at the base of the right lower lobe. Again, little areas of tree and bud at the base of the right lower lobe, and then bronchial thickening and plugging at the base of the left lower lobe. So clearly structural disease, fairly large structures, so it shouldn't be too hard to see uh, by, uh, by MR. This is a, a breath hold technique. So this took a one minute and two seconds to acquire. And you can quite nicely see, again, those same areas of tree and bud nodularity at the base of the right, lower, upper, and left lower uh, lobes. So in a patient that's able to hold their breath well, actually for gross structural follow-up, MRI is probably already appropriate. If you were to take two radiologists and score those scans, score the CT using the Brody score, score the MRI using something similar called the Eichinger score, the correlation between those scores is really quite good. The correlation coefficients of about 0.857. Uh, if you want again to examine people's confidence uh, in marking those uh, or examining those images, look at the interest of variability between the two and actually it's very similar. There's a big advantage in MRI in that actually you can't see quite as much so there's not so much to disagree with. So in terms of a reproducible scoring technique actually it, it's quite good. The, the breath holds are always a big concern uh, in MRI, and it's quite nice to see that in our group, at least, there weren't that many that found it much harder than holding their breath for a CT scan, which is fair enough. So the, um, the one minute and two seconds, I don't expect them to hold their breath for that long, clearly. They do it in three breaths with a, a period of free breathing in between. Each breath hold is 14 seconds. Uh, if you look at the sensitivity, specificity, uh, positive and negative predictive values, you can see the sensitivity and positive predictive values are really rather good. Where we lose uh, against CT is in specificity and negative predictive value. And that's no surprise. So this is not a rule out test for disease. It's a very good rule in test and follow up test. So these patients really ought to have at least one CT to start with uh, and then to be followed up by MR for that point onwards. It's important to think what you're going to be seeing before you pick your population to use MRI for. Um, clearly, we're going to see lots of bronchiectasis and mucus plugging, and as they get older, that's going to predominate. Hyperinflation or gas trapping, whatever you want to call it, is one of the most common features, uh, and it's also an important uh, clinical characteristic. Um, this is a slightly unusual plot, but if you look at the difference between the amount of hyperinflation scored by a radiologist and the amount of large airways disease scored uh, by the same radiologist, and then plot the difference against age. Uh, you can see it's not statistically significant, but those at a younger age tend to have far less large airways disease and far more small airways disease or gas trapping than those who are older. So it's important to be able to see that. Uh, and on CT, we can. This is an eight-year-old, uh, same part of the same cohort. There's their upper lobe predominant bronchiectasis. It's mild. You can see that on, uh, on CT, fine. But the other thing that you can see on the CT, which is very helpful, uh, surrounded by that red uh, contour there, is an area of dark lung. That dark lung is this gas trapping, the small airways disease that we really like to be able to see. Can you see that on the MRI? No, you can't really. Uh, there are some tricks you can do if you take your MRI during end expiration. Sometimes you can see that difference. It's still very subtle by comparison to CT. Uh, CT can take it one step further. You can count the low attenuation pixels, the dark pixels, which are being uh, coded in red here, and again, correlate those to uh, your clinical um, findings. Um, 
if you look over here particularly, the number of those red pixels, number of abnormally dark pixels correlates really quite well against measures such as LCI. So it'd be really nice to be able to see that. Hopefully, here we go. So you can't see it at the moment, but now we can. So now that color overlay is what I want to talk about next. Uh, this is from a, a group in Basel uh, who've been helping us with this part of this technique. Um, as I've already shown you, MRI is able to take videos of motion over time. So here is that same patient breathing in and out. I right? see so the diaphragm's moving, the heart moving backwards and forwards and so on. And if I take an area of the upper lobe, for example, and zoom in, take a smaller area of that. If you look at the contents of that square, ignore any structures, it goes bright and then dark and then bright and then dark. As it goes brighter, that's the patient breathing out. All of their alveolar membranes and interstitium are coming together. There's a greater focus of tissue to give you signal and the gross um, signal in that area increases. As you breathe out, it gets further apart again and you end up with darker looking them. If you then plot that over time, you end up with something like this, this zigzagged uh, sine wave. If you take out that zigzag, uh, it's two, two different signals, one large and slow and one small. This can be done by Fourier uh, decomposition. This technique's called Fourier decomposition imaging. You can take out one large sine wave, which is respiratory frequency. The amplitude of that wave then represents the amount of motion in that area of lung. So the more well ventilated it is, the higher the amplitude of that wave. The less well ventilated it is, the smaller it is. The smaller sawtooth appearance underneath it is pulmonary perfusion. This is the pulse. Uh, you can then map that amplitude pixel by pixel back to the lung and show areas of ventilation defect, decreased motion, and the same thing for perfusion. They've then been plotting that, uh, those for us with normal moving lung, not moving lung, and then moderately and severely impaired motion, uh, which would be a surrogate for uh, um, ventilation. The other thing, as I showed you, if you put contrast in, you can watch it as a video. Well, if you put oxygen in, again, via a little uh, gas mixer into your scanner, you can use oxygen as a contrast agent. This is oxygen being washed in and then washed back out again of the lung of a patient with cystic fibrosis. The spleen at the bottom here enhances once the oxygenated blood reaches it and is used as a way of kind of normalizing the data, if you like. So you can see an area of late peaking that then gas traps a little bit on the way back out. So suddenly we have a way of doing a multiple breath wash in as opposed to wash out, which gives us uh, imaging in the background too. And the important there, importance there, this area of lung is completely non-ventilated. That won't contribute to ventilation and therefore won't be picked up by a multiple breath wash out technique which doesn't have a, uh, an imaging output too. We can take measurements pixel by pixel, plot curves of wash in and wash out times and start to, uh, to compare those. Um, where I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm gonna speed up a tiny bit. We can then take those pixels uh, and plot them as a histogram. So suddenly our imaging becomes fully quantitative. Now this is the wash out time of one of our cystic fibrosis patients, in fact, the one I just showed you, versus the wash out time of me. Um, so mine are very much skewed towards uh, washing out very quickly with the odd pixel here and there, which is quite slow. Look at a cystic fibrosis patient. Some areas wash out normally, but there's much, much more heterogeneity in the washout times across the, uh, across the lung. So that distribution data is extremely helpful. It's probably not a great surprise that individual values, whole lung based values of median washout time, et cetera, are not particularly sensitive to disease change, but markers of heterogeneity really are. Take that same CT, again, draw the region of interest around our area of dark lung, transfer that over to our oxygen washout map. So this is the time expressed on a color scale where red is increased washout time and blue is normal. There's that same area. So suddenly we can see the small airways disease that we wanted to be able to see that we can't by normal um, structural MRI. Let's uh, compare these to, uh, uh, to clinical measures, so particularly to LCI, because that's what we're trying to, uh, to reproduce in an imaging form. Medium values, not particularly exciting. Once you look at the distribution value, so the skew and the ketosis, the spread over time, so the higher the ketosis, the more wide your, uh, your distribution is, uh, the, the more heterogeneous it is, we're starting to get some significance. If you take this uh, matrix pencil technique, which is that Fourier decomposition motion-based 
um, expression of ventilation and perfusion, we're getting some really quite uh, significant correlations between our MRI outputs, LCI, uh, and the CT uh, summary score, which is this column over here. Uh, so in summary, uh, respiratory MRI is very much already in use uh, for tissue characterization, for demonstration of soft tissue to soft tissue interfaces, uh, and even actually in gross structural uh, disease. Uh, the CINE capabilities are extremely useful, uh, and there's an ongoing effort towards uh, instigating these quantitative techniques that show us ventilation uh, and perfusion uh, of the lung in a way that can't really be done uh, by any other modality. Um, so for, from my point of view, the future of pediatric respiratory imaging was one of those questions at the beginning. I think it's definitely uh, heading towards more dynamic assessment, more quantitative assessment, uh, and there's some extremely exciting stuff to come. Um, so I will leave it there. Just a quick thank you to everyone involved in my uh, MD project, from my uh, supervisors, uh, the people that collected the patients together for me, uh, particularly Chris Short, who did all of the LCI measurements for me, and then the groups in Basel uh, and Bioxidine in Manchester, who did our fluid decomposition uh, and oxygen enhanced imaging for us. Um, if you've got any questions, then please do ask away. Okay, and equally, future questions, don't feel that you can't email. Do you? that's uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, Atul, you're still on mute. <laughs> um, Tom, um, should we uh, let Cathy do the talk, and then the yeah. questions can be uh, you can pick it up uh, 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 after the talk. Is that okay? Cool. Yeah, more than happy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the next speaker is uh, Cathy Owens, uh, old mentor friend. And, and, and somebody whom I always need in help and she's always available. Uh, Kathy is, 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 is very well renowned pediatric respiratory radiologist. She was working at uh, Geromo Street and currently has taken some time off to set up a unit in Qatar. And so she's joining us from a Qatar and, and talking about, um, to follow up from uh, Tom's talk, the, the, the future of pediatric respiratory imaging, but now focusing on artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Cathy Owens. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, yeah, I can. Great, straight. So I'll start sharing my slides. Firstly, I'd like to say how um, honoured I am to be involved in this meeting. I'd like to say that uh, it's, I'm just so sad that we can't all be together because I think it would be very nice if we could, but we can't. And this is the next best, best step. Uh, and I think this may well um, lead us into the future. I think the, the future is probably going to be a bit more um, E. Uh, and I think, um, I think in some ways it's good. In other ways, it's a bit sad because I think we need to be together. And I think the things we learn from each other uh, together are really important. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the future of respiratory imaging with a view to childhood interstitial lung disease, which is one of my uh, passions in life. And um, I'm very happy and very lucky to have some very, I was called old by Atul, I forgive him because I probably am old now, but I have some young people that I, um, I uh, have very, very, very luckily met, Tom Temple being one of them. And if there's a, at the end, there's a bibliography of if you want to read more about this subject in, in any more detail, you'll get some uh, references that you'll be able to look at. What I'm hoping to do today is review uh, the classification of ILD and to look at some new examples. So I'm not just gonna talk about AI, I'm going to look, about, look at some of the cases, uh, the newer cases, the newer diagnostics that some of you may not have seen and I think they're important to know about. They're unusual, but they're very uh, important. And then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about artificial intelligence in interstitial lung disease. I'm going to use Joe Jacobs' work. He has been a very inspiring young man in my life and he's uh, the future like Tom, uh, and I'm going to show you some recommended reading at the end. Um, just to remind everybody, you're in the airways business, so you know the importance of the normal development of the tracheobronchial tree, which arborizes up till probably about eight years after birth, some people think. And ideally, if you are lucky, you end up with this very fine network of capillaries and septal um, uh, interstitium, uh, and you have air, which then diffuses into the capillaries and oxygenates blood. And if that all goes well, this is what you find. <laughs> 
Radiologists like looking at images and just the units that we look at or the interlobular septa, the secondary pulmonary lobules. And just to remind ourselves when we're looking at CT in the center of your um, hexagonal, uh, um, polygonal uh, septum, uh, secondary lobule, you'll see a central pulmonary artery and a bronchus. And around the outside in the network of interstitium, you'll see your pulmonary veins. And that's the normal arrangement in a normal child. Just to look at interstitial lung disease in children, it's very different to the adult uh, population. The classification is different and it was very messy. It's still difficult, but the mess was uh, incredible. So, so, um, so, sorry, Cathy. Cathy, we can't see your slides. I'm not sure oh. whether they are shared. So you can't see anything. We can just see you. Oh. So I think Kathy, if you do... press the button, share screen. Yeah, I have done actually. Kathy, can I can I give you a hand there? <clears throat> yes, um, please. I think so. Okay, so um, if you so your PowerPoint is open currently. Yes, it <clears> is. as I understand it. Okay, so if you now just head to the is it uh, in full screen mode at all? Uh, it was in full screen. I'm now trying to okay. share, but it's not actually highlighting. Chats are open are orange, but share screen. Okay. That's yeah. fine. So if, can you see that green share screen button in the middle? Oh, of yeah, I've pressed it several times. <laughs> okay, times. that's all right. That's all right. That's that's why I'm here. So now you've clicked it, you should have a box pop up with different applications and different screens in front. Of yes, you. yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. So one of them will have, is it PowerPoint you're using? Yes, it is. Great. So one of those icons in front of you will likely have the PowerPoint logo next to it. Can you see that? There we go. Now, if you make it full screen, yeah, as you would normally, and then you can present as normal. So the next one over, if you, um, that's, uh, uh, so if you see the bottom right there, there's a little picture of what looks like a projector screen, right in the bottom corner there. That's it. All right, yeah, so, uh, just, uh, I can't see your mouse. If you hover your mouse up a little. Yeah, here's the mouse. So where it says um, lung disease on the bottom right, of the uh, sort of bottom right corner of that uh, image, and then it's got lung induced lung disease. Point that's it. Follow that as if it's an arrow, and there's that icon there. Click that one. There you go. Um, so yeah. we can now all see that. I'm going to dial off, and you continue. All right. Thank you very much. Apologies, oh, I didn't realise. That's see. all right. That works. So hopefully you can see now. So we're looking at the airways. Um, just going back to the secondary pulmonary lobules, the central structures of the bronchus and pulmonary arteries around the outside of the pulmonary veins. Essential to have that. Uh, the, that network of, uh, of features in a normal lung. And just to remember the, the confusion that was interstitial lung disease in the past and how things have been a little bit simplified, although this is by no means simple. And this was the sort of um, schmoggers board of, uh, of, of conditions that we used to talk about. And some of them we've, uh, we've kept, but actually there's a much easier, more uh, straightforward way of looking at things. And this is how uh, we do it. If you think about interstitial lung disease, if you look at the age of the presentation of the child, it's really important. And I think the important diseases that we'll look at, uh, some of them today, diffuse developmental disorders, lung growth abnormalities, specific conditions which have acronyms like PIG and NEHI, and surfactant protein deficiencies, all really important. And this is a crucial crucial thing for radiologists to know when they're looking at imaging that they should really uh, focus on the age of the child and the clinical details. The other conditions you can see, disorders that masquerade as interstitial lung disease, disorders of normal or abnormal hosts, and disorders related to known systemic diseases like juvenile idiopathic arthritis, juvenile dermatomyositis, uh, systemic sclerosis. And if you know this classification, you'll be able to at least put your patient in terms of age or clinical status into one of these little uh, pots is helpful for us. Today I'm going to highlight a little bit about the newer disorders, uh, talk about the ones that are, that are um, highlighted in pink. Uh, looking back in time, Alan Brody and the group in America, Robin Detterding um, and Gail Deutsch, looked at a PATHRAD correlation of 187 patients uh, and basically they looked at the, sat together and classified the disorders according to this uh, classification. Looking at all of the yellow, uh, which were 55% of the cases, were children under the, year, uh, under, under the age of one. So 55% of those 170 cases fit into the category of disorders of infancy. 30% of the conditions that they looked at with PATHRAD correlation fit into the order of the normal systemic um, disease or um, immunocompromised host. So that's 85% of all of the cases, which I think is really important to know. So if you can think along this line, it'll help your uh, radiology 
uh, diagnostics. So let's talk about alveolar growth disorders. We're talking more and more, the terminologies are changing through radiology, we're, we're changing our terminology, and understanding alveolar growth disorders is really important. Uh, basically, histologically classified by enlarged, oversimplified alveoli, commonest cause of chronic diffuse lung disease in children is bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or chronic lung disease of prematurity, which sadly still rears its ugly head quite regularly, despite our rather uh, advanced scientific approach to labour and childbirth and uh, postnatal care. However, we're seeing a lot of children who have chronic alveolar growth disorders in term infants and chromosomally abnormal children in children with certain genetic profiles. One of the things I frequently am asked to look at are children who have trisomy 21. The CTs are done for cardiac purposes often and you'll see abnormal lungs in quite a lot of these uh, patients. Many of them have small peripheral cysts and this is a chest x-ray in a trisomy 21 patient. You can see there's diffuse abnormality there's extensive overinflation of the lungs, there's coarse reticular nodular change. But what you don't appreciate is these paraceptal cysts. You can see around the periphery of the lung, around the periphery, these thick walled septal dysplastic cysts. Uh, very interesting in that they are very characteristic. Histologically, you can see similarly the changes on um, macro specimen with these big subpleural dysplastic cysts adjacent to the pleural surface. In Allen's group of patients, there were quite about 25% of patients had abnormal uh, lung growth, and many of them trisomy 21. And you can see histology from one of his patients, exactly the same, very similar to the Down syndrome I showed you from my own uh, case uh, group. But he also looked at patients with cardiac disease. This child had to have a lung transplant, had severe uh, pulmonary stenosis, and this is the explanted lung where you can see very abnormal, thickened interlobular septa with big dysplastic uh, cysts. This is another example of a minimum intensity projection image showing you these peripheral subpleural paraceptal cysts. The other thing that's very important to know as clinicians when you see these around the fissures, this is the oblique fissure, this is a position of the horizontal fissure, you can see these clusters of cysts. So they're not just peripheral in the, uh, around the rib cage, they're wherever uh, the pleura, pleural reflection sits. This is a coronal image, um, a minimum intensity projection, which again very beautifully shows you the classic distribution of these paraceptal cysts, which cluster along the pleural surfaces. A volume rendered tomogram again shows you these sort of lobulated, indented paraceptal cysts around the outside of the lung, which are worse in the upper zones of the lung. This was a child who was a conundrum. It was a child with persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, uh, had a chest x-ray, which was relatively uh, um, not helpful, but ab very abnormal with quite a lot of per um, ground glass change and the echo showed suprasystemic uh, pressures in the pulmonary arteries. This was a child who had alveolar capillary dysplasia with malalignment of pulmonary veins. And that's a histological diagnosis. However, the CT was relatively interesting and helpful in that it showed you very thickened interlobular septa. You can see these coarse uh, changes around the interlobular septa, this um, crazy paving type pattern. And if you remember, we looked earlier on at where the pulmonary veins sit. They sit around the outside of the interlobular septa. They sit around here. So when they're obstructed, you see the crazy paving pattern. And here you go in the right upper lobe, very, very um, uh, interesting crazy paving related to pulmonary venous obstruction in a child uh, with al alveolar capillary dysplasia associated with malalignment of pulmonary veins. Newer conditions, just going to mention a couple because they're important to know. As I say, they're unusual, but uh, we are seeing more of them. The, this was a child uh, who presented with multiple, uh, multiple lobes, which became more and more overinflated over time. We really didn't know what was going on at four months of age. You can see this hugely overinflated lung with distortion uh, of the anatomy, eversion of the diaphragms, which gets worse and worse. Five months of age, progressive uh, multilobar overinflation. Child also had nystagmus and the respiratory function was getting worse and worse. And here you see the axial CT scans that show you really very beautifully these massively distended air, space, um, air spaces with distortion of lung and um, the pulmonary and um, the anterior pleural reflection has shifted. And there's eight electuses in the lower lobes. And this child was found to have a ciliopathy, a phylum and protein deficiency related to infantile multilobar overinflation. There have been a case series of these have been written up from um, Great Ormond Street 
and from Texas Children's. And these children have ciliopathies, often have abnormalities in other parts of their body. The geneticists have recognized ciliopathies for some time, uh, and we're seeing them more as we look for them in, in families who have uh, ciliopathy. Um, thylamin A is an excellent, is, is encoded on, um, uh, on and is an excellent gene uh, which encodes actin binding cytoskeletal scaffolding involved with neuronal migration, cardiovascular abnormality, and con connective tissue. So it's a multi systemic um, abnormality when it's, uh, when it's uh, manifested. Um, and many of these children have associated uh, brain abnormalities and cardiac valve dysplasias with great vessel aneurysms and have a, a sort of variant of Erlodan loss. So interesting groups of, of patients, important for genetic counselling. Uh, and really in the past, we didn't recognise the lung disease in these patients and many of them succumb from lung disease. So it's important that so as respiratory physicians and as radiologists, we should recognise the lung abnormalities. This is just showing you another patient, another patient with, who developed a pneumothorax with this very coarse uh, progressive low bar overinflation over time. This is uh, the, in, the T0, three months and six months of age. Uh, several of the children have died, and this is an example of the, of the ex um, uh, vivo uh, specimens, which look very much like congenital low bar overinflation, horrible overinflated distorted uh, lobes or subsegments of lung. If you're interested in reading, there is a, a reference here that was, uh, was uh, produced from Great Ormond Street in 2017. So another relatively new condition, not seen so much in children, seen more in adults, but pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis in patients. Uh, this, this is often seen in children who have had, when I say often, I mean when we see it, it's often related to dyskeratosis congenita or patients who've had bone marrow transplantation and severe lung disease. This is an example of a 12-year-old girl who was post bone marrow transplant. She'd had an immunodeficiency and she presented with inexorable breathlessness, unresponsive to therapy. FEV1 was less than 20%. You can see on the uh, chest x-ray that she's had apical uh, blebs have been, um, have been excised because she get, was getting recurrent, recurrent pneumothoraces. You can see on the CT, much more detail. You can see these subpleural cystic areas adjacent to the thickened undulating uh, pleura with um, a fissure. You can see the fissure is actually uh, separated by air. So she's got a loculated pneumothorax on that side. And again, you can see very characteristic findings, subpleural cystic changes associated with undulated pleural thickening. This is the high resolution data set, which again in sagittal will show you very nicely uh, the edge of the lung and these cystic areas, bullous cystic changes, much worse at the APCs than they are down in the lung bases. Characteristic distribution of idiopathic pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis with fibrosis of the peripheral lung and associated with pleural thickening. Predominantly apical and very characteristic distribution uh, on this CT here, the axial images uh, show you very nicely the pleural thickening and the uh, changes in the lung. So ideally, in an ideal world, the hurdles are, as radiologists describing what we see on imaging, we try and find pathological correlation. Uh, we then look for molecular targets using preclinical studies. We try and engage in therapy and we use imaging to follow the patients over time. And it's important to be able, therefore, to quantify uh, in, in, in order that you can see what, the, what effect your therapies are having on the lung. So that's becoming more important, quantification of interstitial lung disease for those patients who are undergoing therapy. So we've looked at the classification. I think if you can remember this, it's quite simple in, in terms of putting patients into uh, age groups and looking to see what their systemic, uh, if they have systemic illnesses or if they have family members with um, surfactant protein, which is a recessive disorder. And that's a way of really trying to keep the radiologists happy and keeping it simple. So now I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the future of radiology with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence is one of the most um, talked about, you, if you Google it in, in, image, in, in radiology meetings, it's one of the most talked about um, areas. Um, why am I interested in artificial intelligence? I think we all are, but my son is, uh, Charles Vase, is a diagnostic uh, imaging engineer. He's an artificial intelligence robotic engineer who looks at plant diseases and early diagnosis of disease in plants. So he's um, instructed me a little and uh, he puts, he keeps it real really. I mean, because I think we all get mystified and we probably get daunted by it. And I think we just have to be real about where we're going with it and what it really can offer. And it can only offer as much as we can ask it to offer and we can sort of uh, feed into the system and be able to extract data which is meaningful. 
So this is my son. He works at the Alan Turing Institute in Manchester. Alan Turing was a mathematician, I'm sure you uh, all uh, remember. Uh, there have been films made about him, books about him, uh, and Charlie works in his uh, institution uh, in Manchester. Charles was always interested in robots. You worry about these people when they play with robots, not other children. Maybe it's something to do with me as a mother, I don't know, but it certainly makes people um, uh, very uh, advanced in terms of electronics as they get older. And this is no new story. This is Arthur Samuel many years ago, sitting at the IBM PC uh, that he had developed and, and had developed to, to play checkers. Uh, and this was considered as a, one of the biggest milestones for AI. And it's not new. Many industries use it, banking uses it. There are many um, neurological uh, MRI um, uh, quantification um, applications, processes for uh, artificial intelligence. But as I said, really, the black box concept is not helpful and that can lead to misuse. And basically, just feeding in a pile of data or getting it out and not knowing what to do with it is not helpful. So we really need to instruct the robotic um, 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 machines and uh, the machine learning into what we need to take extract from it. Um, the many companies have brought out very uh, sexy uh, images about how you can use AI to uh, produce pretty pictures, but we really need to know what difference is it going to make for the patient care. So this is Joe Jacob, who is uh, an excellent uh, doctor I've worked with and had, again, like Tom, had the privilege to write some papers with. And he's developed respiratory applications, tools to quantify lung fibrosis, working uh, with the Mayo Clinic, and his uh, computer-aided lung informatics for pathology evaluation uh, and rating or caliper uh, is extremely uh, ex exciting. It's used in adult lung disease at the moment, not used in, uh, in children. Um, and basically he's, he produced uh, 10 pathologically uh, proven CT training data sets and broke them down into normal ground glass change, reticular change, honeycombing, and low attenuation areas. And this is an example of a patient with UIP, with very advanced fibrotic lung disease, and what he's done is color coded these zones in the air in the lung according to the anatomical abnormalities uh, using the criteria for caliper that he's developed. Interestingly, the computer itself has thrown up patterns of disease which are helpful in terms of correlation. We'll talk about that in a moment. So what basically you can do, you take a volumetric uh, data set from high resolution CT and you color code the abnormalities in order to classify the extent, distribution, and percentage of abnormality. And then you can calculate via a three-dimensional model uh, the abnormalities in the right and the left lung. And it's a very good way of looking at uh, absolute um, numerical data, particularly if you're looking at follow-up in patients and deterioration or improvement post-therapy. The data uh, is um, fed into a convolutional neural data uh, network set and comes out with basically um, having the, the input, be, input being convolutional comes out as a binary uh, classifier, which helps you uh, be methodical about how you interpret the data. The important things, how, how does it make a difference to the patient? Well, using uh, Caliper in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in adults, Joe has managed to look at um, how the uh, patient uh, does um, over time. Uh, one of the things the computer suggested is that the parenchymal vessel distortion was a very good predictor of abnormality in the lungs. So it threw up, said, actually, why not look at the distribution of the parenchymal vessels because they are really abnormal in patients with severe fibrotic lung disease. And actually, that's probably the most sensitive indicator of, of lung um, abnormalities. Joe uh, analyzed 284 uh, patients at the Brompton, followed up for 40 months, and he did visual scoring compared to caliper scoring and used... Um, clinical, established clinical methods, pulmonary functional trans thoracic echo, uh, and looked at, um, looked at the patient's uh, follow-up and the predict and predictions via the imaging. And he used composite physiological index, honeycombing and vessel percentage. These were shown to be really very, very well, uh, um, very useful in terms of um, predictors of outcome. And what was very interesting that the computer itself, which had thrown up this vessel distortion, was actually had the, P, the lowest p-value. So the, the vessel distortion was actually a very good indicator of outcome in these patients with distorted fibrotic lungs. If you want to read um, the uh, data that Joe has recently tried to formulate using um, um, looking at um, observer and inter-observer variation for children's interstitial lung disease, there's a very interesting paper from ERJ Open Research. It shows how bad we are, even as, as uh, established and uh, um, uh, effective radiologists, we feel. People have been in the, in the um, game a long time. 
uh, still don't get it right all the time, of course. They're better than junior doctors, but actually we need machines to help us to quantify and look at patterns of disease. And this is an interesting article from Joe. So hopefully we've reviewed child classification. We've looked at a, some of the older and the newer uh, types of disease that have been published more recently. We've discussed AI in ILD in adults. Uh, and I've given you a list of recommended reading if you're interested in, uh, in reading around the subject. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cathy, uh, uh, for the excellent talk. Um, and 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 um, I think it was um, yeah, I, I was it was meant for a joke, uh, and I think I, I, I apologise <laughs> if I upset it to you. <laughs> no, you didn't at all. <laughs> it's a um, fact. <laughs> um, so a um, few interesting questions, and and um, and and, um, and 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 both Tom and and Kathy are there. So I'll start um, um, from Yeni. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I would like to know how easy it is to train non-pediatric respiratory radiologist on this technique of MRI to generalize to a tertiary hospital around the country. It's a, thank you. So the, um, it's an interesting point uh, because there's a, a really nice thing being a paediatric radiologist at a chest hospital in that we've got the adult chest group and we've got the paediatric group. MRI is very much a paediatric radiology technique. It's not very much an adult uh, thoracic technique, but it's getting there. And it's quite unusual to have a department which doesn't have uh, radiologists who are expert in MRI as well as those who are uh, experts in thoracic imaging. So we just need to bring those groups together, really. They're not difficult techniques to, uh, uh, to use. And with the exception of the ventilation and perfusion images I showed you, they're all normal sequences available on every scanner up and down the country. You've just got to uh, uh, know which ones to go for, basically. So I think it's uh, it's it's doable. Thank you, Tom. Um, another one again for you. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, do you think we are heading towards MRI scanning for assessing airway anatomy? in the uh, dynamic way instead of current techniques? Mm. I think that depends on, uh, on whose airways it is. So the one I showed you is an adult and that's quite deliberate. They have much, much bigger airways. Uh, there is going to become a, a cutoff. Uh, so at the moment we take our MRI uh, down to about the age of six. Uh, under that, it's slightly harder to get uh, compliance, get them to lie still for long enough. And one of the things I'd like to do in the near future is work out how small we can go. Uh, I know there's a group in uh, Rotterdam, Pierre Luigi, uh, Siet has done a lot of uh, MR for dynamic areas assessment in groups of smaller children. So yeah, and it is doable. It's a lot easier uh, in smaller babies to do that under fluoroscopy uh, or CT. Thanks, Tom. I think this is uh, for you, Cathy. Uh, excellent talk. Any potential use of MRS can to follow up children with interstitial lung disease? given the risk of radiation and the concerns of the radiation, we can't do serial um, CT scan on these patients. Has MRA got any place there? So I think Tom very nicely sort of gave you a synopsis of, um, for airways disease, it's uh, extremely useful because you have cellularity, you have abnormal, dis you know, airways, small and large, full of secretions, which show signal. In interstitial lung disease, the, the spatial resolution of uh, CT so that's the ability to sort of see two structures apart and not just blur them together is, is superior to MRI. And also the, the, the acquisition of the images, in, as, as Tom has said to you, uh, it takes about half a second to acquire a whole lung CT, whereas it takes much longer, although there are faster data sets, which Tom has worked on, to, to provide an MR image. So sedation and general anesthesia are, are often an issue in, in getting good pictures of smaller children. So there are some interstitial lung disease. So in, in the answer is not really, not at the moment for most conditions, but there are conditions like pulmonary lymphangiectasia. And I think Tom actually showed you an example. If there's a, or venous obstruction, if there's fluid in the interstitium, you'll see it very beautifully on some of the stirring, on some of the, some of the image sequences, you can see fluid and pleural effusions and interlobular septal uh, fluid. So yeah, pulmonary venous occlusion, patients with um, um, pulmonary lymphangiectasia, it can be useful. The, the other thing to say is firstly, the CT doses are extremely low now. If you look at the newer machines, you can get um, 
if you live in the UK, you, you acquire 2.5 milli sievert, so 2.5 milli sievert just by walking around. In children, you can get um, uh, the, the CT doses down to about half a millisievert or even less than that, 0.25 millisievert. So that's a tenth of the dose. It's what you would acquire in a month of living. So the, the images can be very low dose and they're very, very beautiful because they're acquired very quickly and they almost freeze respiratory artifacts. So I think we just have to be looking at the risk and benefit. And, and Tom is one of the people who does both techniques, so can tell you very honestly, he's not trying to sell his technique. He can give you a very honest opinion of what's useful. And, uh, you know, and it's very good to have we're all zealots in imaging. We, we love our specific area of expertise. And sometimes we're a bit overzealous and we sell it when it doesn't need to be, shouldn't be sold. But remember, we're doing these imaging techniques in children who need to have them because they have a disease and there's a risk benefit ratio in that. And so I think we should, we should, we need to be honest and realistic. And I think Tom is the future because he is both. He's honest, he's realistic, and he works with both modalities. So uh, the future is rosy for all of you. Now then, echo okay, that if I can. And so there's, there's a reason that slide had at the bottom, if you're going to do MRI, pick your population well. So CF, big mucus plugs, lots of, uh, lots of things that give off signal. Uh, interstitial lung disease, very subtle, very small, normally uh, in babies with very, very fast moving small lungs. It's, uh, it's not, not the technique of choice in that, uh, in that group. Thank you um, both. I think the, the next question, I think you've already answered is there a place for MRS scan on the follow-up of antenatally detected congenital lung malformations? We do that already for some, so things like sequestrations where there's a lot of tissue and the vascular component of it, that is, that is doable. Uh, it's not quite so good for things like um, uh, cystic uh, pulmonary adenoidoid malformations, sorry congenital, it's not cystic anymore, is it CPAMs? Um, in that you've got a, then a very thin wall to look at, multi-loculated cysts, something very small, again, in babies, not really the, uh, the right technique to go for. Um, other ones, um, so I mean, other congenital lesions, Cathy, uh, jump in if you want, but some of yeah. the things like congenital um, diaphragmatic hernias and so on, there's a, a role of fetal MRI, so that's quite exciting. There's no air there, you're not looking for very small interfaces anymore, you're looking for gray structures, so before you're born, MR's brilliant, after you're born, it's not really brilliant again until you reach the age of five or six. Yeah, because you're looking for signal, and signal means sort of molecules that, you, you know, an air is a bit of, is a bit slightly sparsely, um, you know, it doesn't really image terribly well. But certainly to quantification of can, um, patients who are born with diaphragmatic hernia and prognostication in terms of uh, longer term out outcome has been well documented, well, well, it's been documented and looking at lung volumes and, and whether or not children are going to require uh, ECMO and what's, how severe their lung hypoplasia is. Uh, related to volumes it is very interesting work because it correlates uh, function as well as uh, structure uh, by by documenting lung sizes so yes excellent uh, thank you very much tom and thank you very much kathy it's said that we couldn't meet face to face but hopefully next year we will yes. be able to yes thank you so much and apologies for the beginning thank you take care okay. bye